COVID-19 has peaked in many countries around the world, but now we are seeing suggestions of a second wave of infections. How accurate is this assessment of a second wave and is it a genuine threat? Could we go back to hard lockdowns again in the future? Joining me to discuss this topic is Ian McGorian, who is an analyst, data specialist, and a consultant who is working with the Panda Group, Panda's Pandemics Data Analysis. Ian, welcome to the CRA channel. Thank you. So now, Ian, we're seeing this so-called second wave, particularly in Europe and in North America as well. Uh, what is your assessment of this? Do you think that this is a genuine concern? And what explains this uh, surge in new infections? Also, the fact that deaths are now also a lot lower than they were in the initial wave. What explains that? Well, <clears throat> I, th I think there's several dynamics that you need to consider when you look at the second wave. There's, there's no doubt that there is a surge in cases in, in Northern Europe, Southern Europe and Western Europe. Uh, in some of those countries, the second surge in cases is double what the, the, the initial outbreak entailed. But there, there are dynamics in Europe, let's start with Europe, that, that we need to consider. The first is that there's been a massive ramp up in testing. So where, where there's those three regions that I was talking about were averaging 315,000 tests a day, they are now averaging close to a million. So we've had a threefold increase in the number of tests actually being done. Obviously, if you if you increase the number of tests, you're going to increase the number of positives. That's a that, that, that's a logical conclusion for anything. The same as if you increase the number of IQ tests you did, you'd have a whole lot more idiots in the country. It's a it's a natural progression. Now, <clears throat> second thing that is happening, well, let's quickly touch on America. America is simply a geographical distribution of the the virus. So we started with a heavy hit in the Northeast, New York, and it has just moved through the latitudes and, and across America. So you're now seeing similar sort of numbers happening in, in states that were very lightly affected in the beginning of the virus, and they're now being as affected as other areas. Still, there are inter-regional inter differences in America, but considering America as one country is just, it, it doesn't make any sense when you're looking at a, a viral spread. And we can show that through things like the Hope Simpson spread of influenza in America. It is very seasonal. So <clears throat> further dynamic at play, um, there has, there's a lot of controversy now around how many cycles the PCRs are going through. And cycling PCRs at 30 to 40, which is happening in Europe, means that you, you, you are <clears throat> really picking up tiny viral loads. You pick up RNA threads that are, when you get up to 30 cycles, we, a, a cycle is not a linear increase in, in your ability to pick up the virus. It's, it's by orders of magnitude. It's a bit like the, the Richter scale for earthquakes. So that's a play. The, the important one for me though, and this is the really important one, is that with the ramping up of tests, as, as I've described, with the ramping up of tests by almost threefold in the last couple of months, what we're doing is we're testing a much broader section, a bro much broader cross-section of the population. So in the early constrained times of testing, uh, pretty much everyone was testing people who they were pretty sure were sick. Uh, you know, we were looking for COVID and we were looking for people who were sick with COVID-like illness and testing them. Now the testing is much more broad. So we, we're testing a, a, a much broader section of the population. What I think is important is that the, there's a difference between a PCR test and the seroprevalence test. And the seroprevalence test is not about do you have COVID-19 COVID now. Seroprevalence tells you if you've ever had it. And the, the, the seroprevalence is obviously a lot more expensive and it's taking a lot longer to, to wheel out. But in the countries that have released results for seroprevalence testing, we're seeing ranges anything between 15 and 25% of people within a population have um, 
have been exposed to the virus have never had any reaction to the virus. And there we go. So Ian, what kind of measure or standard should we be using to assess the progression of the epidemic across various jurisdictions and who exactly should be tested? Okay, so <clears throat> it, is, it has become patently clear that what we're looking at in Europe now is a case demic rather than a, <laughs> not than a, rather than a pandemic. Um, and, and to your point, the death curve is simply not reflective of the second wave. The, the death curve in Europe is in extremely shadow at the moment in every country that you look at. So you can look at it at a granular basis or you can look at it at a maximum basis. So what we're seeing is a test. We, we're seeing a, a test increase, a case in, increase, but none of the consequential increase. In other words, the hospitalizations, the ICU and the, the deaths are not tracking this new wave. So an interesting development this week is that Belgium has abandoned test um, metrics completely. And they are now tracking the disease by hospitalization number. And that, that seems to be an eminently sensible approach because that gives you a, a true feeling of you know, how serious is this COVID-19 thing? And obviously the call right from the beginning has been, we, do, we don't want our hospitals to be overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the battle cry for lock, lockdown. And so Belgium has taken an interesting step. They're saying, yes, well, now let's use the data that is important and that is hospitalization. So Ian, can we expect a second wave here in South Africa and particularly given that Zwilliam Kieser, the health minister, has indicated that South Africa is looking to ramp up its testing going forward. Could that not reveal many of these underlying cases that you spoke of earlier and perhaps trigger uh, some kind of, of, of harsher lockdown-like reaction from the government? Oh, well, uh, to... <clears throat> I'll explain this as quickly as I can. There is no doubt that a coronavirus is going to be seasonal. There's no question. I mean, why, why would this virus be any different to any other coronavirus? And all of them are seasonal. So to, exp to expect seasonality, well, yes, absolutely. Uh, to have a knee-jerk reaction and a, a further lockdown, well, I certainly hope that that doesn't happen. I certainly hope our government has learned a very stern lesson about the, the, the folly of lockdown. Um, <clears throat> so to answer the question, yes, I fully expect a seasonal COVID-19. I expect it for, a, <laughs> for years to come. It's going to become part of the vocabulary, just like influenza, just like it, all sorts of other things, but we have gone through the big hit, the first hit, and now it's going to become part of our lives, just like everything else is part of our lives. We live with TB, which is viral. We live with hepatitis. We live with all sorts of things. So let's, let's start being rational and let's start applying some critical thinking to this. Ian, thank you very much. That's all we have time for today but we will put a link to the Panda channel in the description below. Please remember to like this video, share it on your social media platforms, and do subscribe to the channel as well for our daily updates. Do also check out the link in the description below to a 30-day free trial to the CRA where you can access all of our reports and our briefings on an ongoing basis. That's it from me, David Ansara. Until tomorrow, take care.